Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We do not have time to go through this entire chapter, but I want you to have it there so that as we look at it piece by piece, you'll be able to follow along. The F-22 Raptor is considered by many to be the most advanced fighter plane ever, ever developed. The Raptor carries a powerful array of weaponry and has exceptional maneuverability. No other country has a plane equal to the F-22 Raptor. United States law makes it illegal for the manufacturer of the plane to sell it to any other country, including our allies. But I'm here to tell you this morning, this amazingly exceptional plane is useless without a pilot. And for this plane to fully function as the designer intended it, the pilot must be in complete control of the plane. Likewise, human beings are considered to be, by some, the most complex form of life to exist. The Bible says we are made in the image of God. Therefore, humans possess not only amazing physical and athletic and mental capabilities, but we also have great moral capabilities. But... We will never reach our full potential unless God is our pilot. And if we are to fully function as our designer intended, God must have more than just partial control of our lives. He must be in complete control of our lives. Obedience to God is like a password unlocking the blessings and the power of God in our lives. Near as I can tell, there are only two kinds of individuals in this world. Disciples of Jesus Christ who obey the Lord and people who do their own thing. In his New Testament letter, James writes, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says or you are only fooling yourselves. Following God's way, God's word, is not only the right way to live, it's the only way to live. During the American Civil War of the 1860s, President Abraham Lincoln gathered together with a group of ministers for a prayer breakfast, and one of them said, Mr. President, we need to pray that God is on our side instead of, I suppose, on the side of the Confederacy, demonstrating the depth of his wisdom and his faith. President Lincoln replied, no, gentlemen, let us pray that we are on God's side. Over the past few weeks, we have been on a spiritual journey through the New Testament letter of First Peter entitled, No Matter What. The Christians of the first century to whom Peter was writing were under intense persecution and stress. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, the apostle reminds us, no matter what, stay true. And how do we stay true to God? We stay true to God by letting him be the pilot of our lives, by being obedient to him instead of trying to do life without him. So I just want to remind you, don't forget to check out on our church website. There's five new videos that uh, the staff have have, uh, filmed each week dealing with today's um, text. I want to encourage you to read through all five chapters of 1 Peter as many times as you can each week. And if you have specific prayer needs that come up as we go through this, make sure and write them on a piece of paper and put them over there in the prayer wall. Um, Again follow along as we look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to ask the question, what are some ways that believers can obey God in our everyday lives? So we're just going to start with verse 1, and we see in verses 1 through 6, Peter first of all addresses wives. 
One of the prayers that Jewish males offered to God in the first century was this. God, I thank you that I am not a Gentile. I thank you that I am not a slave. And I thank you that I am not a woman. Seneca was a first century Roman philosopher. Seneca said, and I quote, women are married to be divorced and divorced so they can be married. This was prevalent amongst most of the cultures of the first century, which means that women in the first century were viewed by men as property more than they were viewed as people. So Jesus Christ comes along, and Jesus aims to change that. Jesus aims to elevate the status of women. Now, if you have your Bibles and you look back there in chapter 2 and verse 12, Peter tells all Christians the way that we win people to the Lord is through our behavior. When the world sees the way a Christ follower lives, or at least the way that we should live, the world will be attracted to the Christ we follow. Does that make sense? Because of the man's role of authority in the family there in the first century, if he became a Christian, the others in the family had to do the same. Whether they wanted to or not, whether they were willing to or not, if he said this is what we're doing, then everybody had to follow suit. On the other hand, if a wife became a Christian here in the first century and the husband didn't want to, he could divorce her. So if I can paraphrase what Peter is saying here in verses 1 through 6, it might go like this. Ladies, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, the way to influence your husband to also follow Jesus with you is not by nagging him, and neither will he be convinced to follow Jesus by simply how physically attractive you make yourself. An unbelieving husband, Peter says, will be interested in knowing more about your Jesus when he observes behavior from you that is not of this world. Peter is not saying that all women should submit to all men in all circumstances. And neither is Peter implying that wives should obey their husbands on all things. All authority is given by God. Therefore, Christians are not obligated to obey things, authority, when we are asked to do things God has already forbidden us to do. For example, Christians are commanded to submit to the government elsewhere in Scripture, including earlier here in Peter's letter. But when government officials told Peter and John to quit preaching in the name of Jesus, they refused to follow them. They refused to do so. Now, submission oftentimes sounds like a dirty word in our society, in our culture today, because we're, honestly, we're, we're used to having it our own way. We don't like anyone telling us what to do. And as Frank noted last week, submission is something that believers do voluntarily. We do it out of love and respect, respect primarily love and respect for God. We need to understand the order and the effectiveness of a family unit, of a nation or society, of a business or any organization. It is dependent upon the submission of people in that organization or that family or that nation to the authority that has been given. Otherwise, there's going to be total chaos. Joseph Gant fought in both World War II and the Korean conflict. He was captured by the Koreans in 1950 and died the following year. But the Koreans would not confirm his death or return his body. So as we all would in that situation, his wife Clara held out hope for decades, decades, that her husband would come home. She would constantly meet with government officials, seeking as much information as she could about her husband. Clara bought a house. She had it professionally landscaped. 
so that if and when her husband returned, all he'd have to do is go fishing. Now that's the kind of wife to have, right? She was 94 years old, Clara, when her husband's remains were finally brought home. And he had a military funeral in December of 2013. She told a reporter at that time, and I'm quoting, Joseph said that if anything happened to him, he wanted me to remarry. I told him that wouldn't happen. He may be gone, but I'm still his wife. And I will remain his wife until the Lord calls me home. That's the behavior of a godly woman. And with that kind of behavior, she influences everybody around her. That is the agape, unconditional love that never quits, never gives up, never loses hope. That's the kind of love that a wife is to have for a husband and a husband is to have for his wife. Peter goes on to address husbands in verse 7. In his commentary on 1 Peter, Gareth Reese asked this question. If you're looking there at uh, verse 7, he asked this question, how is a wife a weaker partner from her husband? Because that's what Peter says in verse 7. Reese asked, is she weaker spiritually? Is she weaker than her husband mentally? Is a woman weaker than a man morally? Is a wife weaker than her husband physically? Reese says, well, maybe in brute strength she is, but not in stamina. Because when a, a man and a woman have the same sickness and he can't get out of bed, she's still doing her household chores, caring for the kids, and maybe even caring for him. Now, I know that to be true. Any of you other guys? Okay. What Reese thinks is that Peter is saying a woman is weaker emotionally because she's more easily crushed emotionally than a man would be under similar circumstances. And that's why Peter tells Christian husbands to be careful in what we say to our wives, to be careful in what we do to our wives. The great Bible commentator William Barclay maintains it was Christianity that taught men how to be compassionate, how to be tender-hearted, how to look to the needs of others instead of just themselves. So while Peter tells wives, Christian wives, they must submit to their husbands, Peter also tells Christian husbands, we must commit to our wives. We don't give up on that relationship. And that wasn't common amongst first century husbands. In fact, Paul says that kind of attitude is only going to happen when we first commit ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ. A Christian husband protects his wife, not just physically, but more important, emotionally. A Christian husband doesn't say things to purposely hurt his wife. A Christian husband isn't concerned with blaming his wife for his own shortcomings or getting even with her perceived wrongs. A Christian husband goes out of his way to respect his wife, to honor his wife, to build up his wife, to support his wife, both in private and in public. Can I get an amen from the ladies there? Thank you. I thought I heard guys saying that. That's good. I don't know if you've heard of John Wooden. Uh, if you're old enough, you have. He was the legendary coach of the UCLA basketball team. Great example of a Christian man. He read his Bible every day. Wooden was outspoken on the fact that his faith was more important to him than basketball. His players revered him because their coach gave them principles that helped them succeed in life, not just in basketball. During a 12-year span in the 1960s and the 1970s, um, his UCLA teams won 10, 10 national championships in 12 years, seven of them in a row. John Wooden once said, and I'm quoting here, passion is temporary. Love is enduring. 
And I know I shared this story many years ago, but it's worth repeating over and over again if you haven't heard it. John Wooden's love for his wife, Nellie, was the stuff of romantic legend. They met as freshmen in high school. They married at the age of 21. Almost 53 years later, Nellie died of cancer on March 21st of 1985. John Wooden would live 25 more years. And on the 21st of every month, marking the anniversary of the day on which Nellie died, John Wooden would visit the crypt where Nellie's ashes were kept 25 years every month on the 21st. And he would write a letter to his deceased wife on that day put it in an envelope, tie it to a stack of other letters that he had written, and place that stack on the pillow where, that Nellie used in their bed. He closed every letter by telling Nellie how much he missed her and how much he looked forward to being with her again in heaven. That is the kind of godly behavior of a man that influences everyone around him. That is the agape, unconditional kind of love that never quits, never gives up, and never loses hope. That's the kind of love that a Christian husband is to have for his wife, and a wife is to have for her husband. And then Peter gets into verses 8 through 22, and he addresses all of us. These are some ways that all of us can be obedient to our God. In verse 8, if I can summarize those things, he says we need to be united in our love for each other and for others. Peter says Christians need to be like-minded in the way that we love. How can we do that? Well, we, we are like-minded when we all pattern the love of Jesus Christ. And here's some practical ways, he says in verse 8. We should be sympathetic to each other's needs. We need to be tender-hearted with each other. We need to be compassionate. Instead of getting angry, instead of being frustrated with people because of the way they act or the things that they say, we need to put ourselves in their shoes. We need to see life through their eyes and and, and in doing so, understand why. Peter says that's going to require a humble attitude, but as Christians, that's what we have to strive for. Matt White was a 30-year-old college graduate who usually shopped for his groceries at Kroger's. It was located in an upper-class part of Memphis. On one of his trips, he walks out of the grocery store with his, his groceries in hand, and a 16-year-old boy introduces himself as Chauncey Jones Black. The young man said he had traveled by bus to the rich people's Kroger's to work for his supper. Chauncey offered to carry Matt's groceries to the car in exchange for a box of donuts. Matt soon discovered that Chauncey lived with his mother, and they didn't have much money. So Matt took his new friend inside the store, and they began to buy groceries and toothpaste and toothbrushes and paper plates and on and on and on. And the more they talked, the more Matt was impressed by, by Chauncey's attitude, by his desire to succeed and succeeding to help his mother in return. Determining there's no way he could take all of that stuff on a bus, Matt gave the young man a ride home. And he met Chauncey's mother, Barbara, and discovered they loved, lived on her disability check. There were no groceries in the refrigerator at the time. Matt decided he needed to do more, that those groceries would run out in a week. So he, he shared his chance encounter with Chauncey on Facebook, along with a video interview that he did with Chauncey. He attached a GoFundMe page to his Facebook post so others could help. Viewers fell in love with this young man and gave $340,000 total to Chauncey and his mother 
So Matt visited and worked with a lawyer to ensure that money was wisely spent, that it would go to help them get a different place to live, and it would help uh, fund Chauncey's college education. I share this with you because Matt White is a practicing Christian. And he got involved in this young man's life. He didn't just help him out temporarily. Now, Matt gives credit to God and all of the people that God worked through, but Chauncey and his mom thank God for putting Matt in front of them and in their lives. And I thought about that story, and it got me to thinking, what if, what if every one of us, what if every one of us saw ourselves as superheroes scattered by God to be the church wherever we do life by benefiting others? What if all of us, like Matt White, we prepared in the grocery store, at the gas station, at school, at work. What if we were prepared to do the same? What if, instead of just giving money and feeling good about ourselves, what if we chose to actually invest our time in helping others like Matt did? It was so cool last night, our one one-for-one one recipient from June was here last night in our worship services with her two boys. Man, she was, she was beaming. And it wasn't because we just gave her a check for 800 and some dollars. It was because one of our members chose to get involved with her life. It's amazing what can happen when a body of believers unite together to love our community and our area in Jesus' name. In verses 9 through 13, Peter says, as Christians, we need to be obedient to God by seeking peace. Now, what's the normal reaction when we've been wronged? The natural way to respond is an eye for an eye, right? Tooth for a tooth, retaliation. What did Jesus teach instead? Well, if someone slaps you on one cheek, you turn to them the other cheek, right? If someone takes you to court, you don't get even with them. You love them instead. If someone offends me, if someone hurts me, I, I, it's not my desire to get even. Peter says in these verses, if you really want to enjoy life, try holding your tongue once in a while when you really feel like, what you really feel like doing is giving somebody a piece of your mind. Try paying a compliment sometime to an individual who's just insulted you. And when we do that, when we seek peace in those ways, it's amazing how the world will look at us and go, there's something different about them. Well, you better believe they should say that because that's what they said about Jesus. In verses 14, 16 through 18, Peter says we need to suffer like Christ. Now, none of us is ever gonna suffer to the degree that Jesus suffered here on earth. Peter says it's one thing to gracefully suffer or to gracefully serve jail time when we deserve it, when we've done something wrong and we, we should be there. But that person who is grace-filled even when they've done nothing wrong, that person is imitating Jesus. So even in our suffering, even when we've been wronged or offended, the Apostle Paul says whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. There really is no indication that when Joseph was sold by his brothers to slave traders on their way to Egypt, or when Joseph was wrongfully accused of attacking his master's wife and as a result thrown in prison, there's no indication that, that Joseph got angry and, and complained and wanted to get even. And because he didn't, God ultimately gave him a position and a place where Joseph saved many, many lives. That's what happens when we suffer like Christ. Verse 15, Peter says we need to be prepared. 
Prepared what? Well, when someone asks you about your faith, you need to be prepared to give them an answer. Listen, when we go to court, don't we gather as much documentation as we can? As much information as we can in case we need it there in court? I've been to court. I know what happens. Your lawyer coaches you on what to wear. What expressions are good expressions and what expressions aren't good expressions? What questions you might get from the other side and how you should answer those questions, etc. In the same way, Peter says, man, we need to be prepared when people ask us questions about our faith. If Coach John Wooden could read his Bible every day with the busy schedule that he has, who of us is able to say, well, I don't have time? We don't have to be experts. We don't have to give the 100% correct answer every time. We just need to be prepared with basic biblical answers. And furthermore, Peter says in, in these verses that when we give our answers, we need to do so without getting defensive without getting combative, but rather to do so in love. And in verses uh, 19 through 21, Peter says, and I can just be blunt, he says, you need to be baptized. You read it there. Uh, we, churchgoers have disagreed about the purpose of baptism and the timing of baptism and who should be baptized and the method of baptizing. We've been arguing those things for centuries, but I'm going to tell you, they had very few questions or disagreements about this during the first two to 300 years of Christianity. They knew what it was all about. Peter says baptism isn't necessary for physical cleansing. You don't get baptized just to wash dirt off of your body. Baptism is an appeal to God for a clear conscience. It's an appeal to God for spiritual cleansing. And the fact of the matter is, if you look in Scripture, Jesus told us to be baptized. Peter tells us to be baptized. Paul tells us to be baptized. I think we're probably supposed to do that. Now, can God save those who, who aren't baptized? Well, listen, God can do anything he wants to. Baptism is a heart issue. Because it's an obedience issue. And I'm pretty certain God expects us to obey his commands, all of them. I don't know of any command that you and I can look and go, well, you know what? I know I'm not supposed to be greedy, but listen, in this case, it's okay. We, there isn't any command that we can do that, including this command. And I, I just want to run a, a quick video here because I, I think Francis Chan pretty much... Uh, puts that in perspective. Let's go ahead and watch. Look, when, when, when my daughter comes to me and I say, hey, go, go clean your room, she knows better. She, she's not gonna come back a couple hours later and say, hey, Dad, I memorized what you said to me. You said, go clean your room. You know, what am I gonna say? Oh, good job, that's what I wanted. No, and, and she's not gonna come to me and say, Dad, I can say, go clean your room in Greek, listen. That's not going to fly. And, and what if she says, you know what? My friends and I, we're going to gather together, and every week we're going to have a study, and we're going to figure out what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> no, none of that's going to fly. Just go and clean it. She knows that. So why do we think that this type of thinking or this type of talk is going to work with Jesus? I mean, Jesus was as black and white as you get. He would look at people and he'd say, why do you call me Lord? when you don't do what I say. He says that in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I ask you to do? I mean, why would you call someone your master and then not listen to him? And, and he says in Matthew 7, 21, he goes, listen, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is gonna enter the kingdom of heaven. It's only the one who actually does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so we get to verse 22, and Peter concludes this portion of his letter with these words, now, now, Christ has gone to heaven. 
He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels, authorities, and powers accept his authority. Now listen. Remember, Peter was there in Acts chapter 1. He personally saw Jesus ascend into heaven. He was awestruck by what he saw. And Jesus returned to heaven because Jesus completed all the Father had commanded and told him to do. When he got to the end, he said, it's finished. He was fully obedient, doing everything the Father had commanded, culminating with his death on the cross. And because Jesus finished that work here on earth today, he is beginning a new work in each of us. When we yield our lives to him, he begins to cleanse us from the inside out. Chris Simpson lost his father and his grandfather at a young age, and he, he chose to become angry with God. And when a few years later, when he and his wife lost their first child, Chris was an easy mark for a white supremacy group that fueled that anger. As near as he can remember, Chris had 42 tattoos all over his body. And they were full of hate. One of them on his knuckle read, pure hate. He and his wife, Misty, went on to have five children. And when the children began to sound as angry as their dad, when the children began to use hateful words and terms like dad, the seeds were planted in Chris's heart to change. Well, after watching the movie Courageous, and I, I don't know how many of you have seen that, but it, it stresses the need for strong Christian male leadership in a home, in a, in a marriage. And Chris and his wife began attending the New Horizons Community Church near Detroit, Michigan. And on April 15th of 2012, Chris was baptized, burying his old nature and coming out of that watery grave with a desire to be a new man. These days, his family still following dad's example. But these days, they begin their meals with prayer. And today, his kids are walking by faith in Jesus Christ. Five days after his baptism, Chris began the painful process of removing his tattoos. He says they're far more painful. It's like putting acid on his tattoos when they do this process. Far more painful than when he first received them. But he wants to totally separate himself from that past and what those tattoos say, from that life of anger and that life of hate. And today, he and his wife have started a, a new ministry called Random Acts of Kindness. I'm just saying that when we yield it's am and when we're obedient, it's amazing what God can do in us and through us. I'm just wondering today, I, I don't know where you're at in your walk with, with Christ or in your spiritual journey. Is it time to put your past behind you? Is it time to bury those sins in the watery grave of baptism? Is it time to put to death that old nature and be born again with a new nature that desires to serve God?